MBPPC Backyard Preacher on this 23rd Sunday in the ordinary season of the Christian year. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Let us pray. In these days, O Lord, of disagreement and contention, and of great unrest, guide us into your truth through these teachings of Jesus. May we find a way to contribute to a more peaceful and just world and to find in our own lives the courage and the humility of faith to speak and hear your truth for the sake of your justice and your righteousness and your peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. A reading from Matthew 18, 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and tell that person their fault between you and them alone. If they listen to you, you have gained them as your sister or brother. But if they do not listen, Take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If they still continue to refuse to listen, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen even to the church, let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The crux of this teaching today is not just about conflict resolution, not just about naming sin when it appears in our community of the church, but also in creating an environment within the body of Christ, within the congregation of a church that can allow for justice and an equitable distribution of power to ensure that the truth-telling that must be a part of naming sin in our midst, that that truth-telling has a safe and fair place to be expressed. Let me explain. Years ago, my wife and I went to see a movie, and before the movie started, I went out to the lobby to buy some popcorn. As I was standing in the line waiting to buy the popcorn, I realized that a mutual acquaintance of ours was standing in front of me, a young woman whom we knew mostly through a friend of ours, but whom we didn't know well personally. Well, we had met this young woman on several occasions and both my wife and I found it difficult to abide her presence. Nevertheless, we were pleasant to each other and we chatted as we waited in line. And then I got my popcorn and I returned to our seats and sat down next to Lisa and we waited for the movie to start. And as we were waiting, I said to her, you'll never believe who I ran into out in the lobby. And she said, who was it? And I said the young woman's name and she groaned and I said, I know. Well, just at that very moment, the person in front of us turned around there she was, the very woman of whom we were speaking disparagingly. I still remember vividly the feeling I had of wanting to say to her, no, this isn't the real me. That pleasant guy out in the lobby, that's the real me. Just let me disappear and vanish. Let me find a rewind button. Let me get out of here. Let me do this over. All of my energy and everything I felt was about defending myself against what was really a situation of being caught 
red-handed. And Jesus understood that we human beings react this way when we are in the presence of our own sinfulness, when we are in the presence of our words and our deeds that are harmful, that are damaging to other people or even groups of people, or perhaps even damaging to the world itself. It's important to understand this aspect of who we are in a time like ours. These are days in which many people are calling out the sin of racism in the midst of us in this country and claiming that the, the powerful and the privileged people who are those of us of the white race are responsible for correcting a centuries deep and still very, very present racism that affects personal relationships, but also reflect, re affects our structures in government and in commerce and in school and in entertainment and also in the church. But as the moral philosopher Alastair McIntyre so skillfully pointed out in his book, Three Rival Versions of Moral Inquiry, we live in a culture right now in which we have no common agreement about the foundations of moral inquiry, about how to think about justice and about what is right and what is wrong and what's sinful and what's not. And so what frequently happens is that when someone names racism happening in the words or deeds of another or points out racism that has become structuralized and that benefits whole groups of people and damages and harms and puts in danger for their lives of other groups of people. Those who are being accused, those who are being held accountable, go on the defensive like I did, like my mind did at that movie theater. I'm not racist. I have black friends. I'm, I'm a good guy. For many, there's an inability to make the leap from personal uh, ego identity to the more abstract understanding of uh, a systemic thing, like systemic racism, or to recognize that I may personally harbor no ill will toward people whose skin color is different from mine, but I nevertheless benefit from structures that are driven by, that were, that were created by and are continuing to be driven by a racism that privileges me and gives me uh, a freedom of movement and speech and opportunity that is, ex that is kept from other members of the culture. And so these are times especially when we need a wisdom to help us to create a common ground for even beginning to assess sin in the form, for example, of racism. To even begin to have a credible place where one Christian can say to another one, your behavior or your words are sinful, they're harmful, they, they violate the law of love. Much less for groups of Christians to be able to say this to each other. Well, this teaching from Jesus today in Matthew 18, 15 through 20, offers a powerful foundation for uh, moral inquiry, for recognizing sin, and for having the courage to speak truthfully about it when it manifests itself, either in individual relationships or in groups. I want to just point out quickly the method Jesus outlines. He says that if one person sins against another one, the person sinned against should go to the, uh, the other and explain what they see as happening, to tell their truth, and to ask the other to engage with them in, um, in rectifying the situation and in, in resolving the conflict and in uh, keeping the sin from, from becoming more pervasive. If the person accused 
disagrees that it's sinful or refuses to take responsibility, then the next step is to bring several more witnesses, which uh, is consistent with Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, which says that an accusation isn't legitimate unless there are witnesses to corroborate it. Then third, if the accused continues to refuse to participate in reconciliation or, or to acknowledge the sin, then the whole church is to be brought in. And it would be so wonderful if we could just learn those three steps and call it a day and say that, you know, the church is um, absolutely protected against conflict and against the power of sin to divide and destroy by applying those three steps. But what I want to highlight today is something I think more important and more fundamental here. It's not just following the three steps, but it's creating an environment where the person wronged can feel safe in speaking their truth to their accuser, uh, to, their, to the accused. And the accused can find the humility not simply to go on the defensive immediately, but to hear the person's uh, accusation and to let it be resolved and evaluated in a way that is honest and fair and right. There are two things undergirding Jesus' three-step teaching here, and they are also in chapter 18 of Matthew. The first is that preceding our reading from today, verses 15 through 20, three times in this chapter, Jesus makes it very clear that in the, in the community of, uh, of faith, in a church, in a congregation, we are obligated to make sure that the least powerful, that the most vulnerable, that the easiest to manipulate or push aside are empowered to speak their truth, especially in times when there is conflict or when there is the uh, experience of sin. So in uh, chapter 18, in verses 4 through 6, this is what Jesus says. Whoever humbles herself or himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for that one to have a great millstone fastened around their neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. And in verse 10, Jesus says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father, who is in heaven. Jesus calls for us all to strive for a childlike humility, for a, ideally, an egolessness, so that when we are accused, our first impulse is not to protect our ego self at all costs, and to stray away from the truth far into the realm of um, deception and abuse of power and silencing. But even more, he says, that it's, it's the responsibility of the community to honor the least in its presence, the children, the little ones, to give them a measure of power in the community, but especially in times when they need to speak a truth that calls out sin. This might be literally children in the church. It might be women. It might be people who are in any kind of a minority group. It could be a political minority. It could be a racial minority. It could be an a, 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 a ability disability minority. All of these places where left to our own devices, it's easy for the powerful to manipulate and marginalize and oppress the powerless. Jesus says, no, if you are to resolve conflict justly, if you are to name sin in a loving and truthful and courageous way that can 
allow for healing, then there has to be a redistribution of power that honors the, the relative uh, powerlessness that can reside with the little children, the uh, little ones, the least in the congregation. So that's the first step. There has to be a safe environment to speak the truth. Second, in verse 20, Jesus says a very often quoted and familiar thing. Wherever two or more of you are gathered, there I am with them. Now, out of context, that's just kind of a lovely sentiment. <clears throat> that seems to mean that if there are two Christians together, minimum, or any number greater than that, Jesus is in the midst. Church is happening. But it's important for us always to remember the context of Jesus' teachings. And in this case, verse 20 is the crown of his teachings about uh, speaking the truth when there is sin, speaking out for justice when there is injustice, asking and requiring uh, a forum for healing when harm has been done. And what he is saying is, when there is an accusation of sin, you, the accused, have something more than your own ego self to honor and respect and rely on and to act out of. And that's me, Jesus. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm paying attention. And you are responsible also to listen and to honor and to pay attention in my name and literally in my presence. So instead of the first step when we are accused being to defend ourselves, Jesus is saying, turn to him, honor his presence, and do what he's doing, which is listening for the truth. So it's these two things in this teaching that are the most important. To recognize that the risen and living Christ is in our midst and that to him we are accountable for our deeds, as it said in last week's uh, lesson. He will judge our deeds. And so we can begin by honoring his presence and we can ideally have worked already to create an environment where all members of the community have equal power to speak the truth, and especially in these very difficult, painful times when we don't agree about the truth, when there is an accusation of sin committed by one against another or by a, a group or a system against, against other members of the congregation, that we can create an environment where there is a, a safe way to go about these steps calling out the sin and inviting the accused into a shared work of reconciliation, bringing witnesses when it seems as though things are devolving simply into a he said, she said situation, and bringing things into the light of the whole church when we really uh, cannot resolve the conflict individually or in a small group. In regard to this truth that is um, what we all should be aiming for as Christians, I want to share another reading, another teaching of Jesus that talks about truth in the context of sin and of healing. This is what uh, Jesus says in John's Gospel. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Now what that means is that when I'm accused of sin, its power over me, its power of untruth and of lies, kicks in, and I want to defend myself at all costs and not uh, take responsibility for myself. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. 
The slave does not continue in the house forever. We are alienated from the living relationship of the body of Christ. We're alienated from our sisters and brothers in the church when more of our energy goes into defending our ego than seeking healing in the power of love. But the son, he says, continues forever. So if the son, and he means himself, makes you free, you will be free indeed. So if he's risen in our midst and among us, we can turn to him and find a way to sort out whether what is being spoken is true. And if we are the one committing the sin, that we can listen to his guidance, his counsel, his truth, and find healing, not to expel us from the community, far from it, but to heal the wound in such a way that the bond of love is even stronger between the, uh, the two disagreeing parties, the, sinned, the sinner and the sinned against. Finally, I think all of this honors what Jesus calls the second of the two greatest commandments, the ones that are so great that he says the whole law and all of the prophets in the Bible rest on these two. And of course, the first is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second is to love our neighbor as ourself. And I believe that if we strive for a church where it's safe for the powerless and the vulnerable, to speak their truth when they're wronged, and where it's safe for the accused to submit themselves to the healing power of Christ's love, then we also find an ability to honor this great commandment, to put the other in the center of our consciousness, to strive to love them as we love ourselves, and to see to it that where bonds of love and friendship have been broken. When we, in the presence of Christ, can humble ourselves and find the truth, then not only are the bonds healed, but they're made stronger, and the community dwells in the light of Christ more powerfully than it did before. May this be for each of us and for all of us who are members of the body of Christ, not only a high calling, but a great personal and corporate aspiration. To the glory of God, in the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, amen.